Thank you very much. Uh, Robin Layton. Thank you. So I'm here on behalf of 1,100 low-income working families with young children enrolled at Educational Enrichment Systems 22 centers in San Diego County, all funded under the program that Deborah described over here through the Department of Education. Thank you. So uh, I'm here to talk about, uh, as Christian wanted me to talk about, and thank you, Dr. Weber, as well, to talk about uh, my 30-year uh, career with educational enrichment systems. Last year, I celebrated 30, my 30 year anniversary as president and CEO, and several reporters contacted me to discuss the state of early education in California. And during these quest, uh, conversations, two questions kept coming up. The first was why I have worked in this field for my entire career. The answer to that is quite simple and yet filled with complexity. Hardworking families desperately need affordable and accessible childcare, and their young children deserve to be in high quality programs. But it's about more than the families with children in our program. It's about what our communities, our state, and our country will look like 15 years from now when today's three year olds become adults and face decisions that will undoubtedly affect all of our future. Take Tariq, a toddler when his mother enrolled in our program in 1998. Like the other children at EES, Tariq learned his letters and numbers by playing games and singing songs. He learned about nature by exploring it and art by creating it. Learning was a great adventure for Tariq and his classmates, and when they started kindergarten, they were ready to succeed. Today, Tariq is enrolled in, at a local college and dreams of a career in science. During the time that Tariq was able to attend EES, his mother left an abusive relationship and secured a good job where she has been employed for more than 16 years. Children in our program live with two sets of realities. Recently, one of our four-year-olds named Annabella told her teacher that she's worried about her mother being cold because she sleeps on the floor so she and her brothers can have the bed. And four-year-old Oscar told us he joins his mother and his 12-year-old sister as she works her second job delivering newspapers in the middle of the night. The home lives of these children are loving, but they struggle for the very basics that, may take, that we may take for granted. And then they see another reality. They come to our centers and engage in hands-on learning, work in the garden, and share nutritious meals together. To me, these two realities represent a fork in the road. Which way will these children go? toward education and productivity, or will they continue a cycle of poverty and struggle? I was asked to join this panel here today, not simply because I have spent my career in early education, but because I am also a product of it. Like so many families at EES, I grew up with a single mother who worked three jobs to support my siblings and me. By day, my mom was a county eligibility worker in East Los Angeles, and at night, she was a proofreader at the LA Times, and on the weekends, she was a typist for a small business. And I grew up in Montebello in the 60s and 70s, and one of the most vivid memories I have is my mother sending me into Balcom's Family Market, where my mother had bounced a check for our groceries. She sat in our Chevy Impala <clears throat> with the chip paint and torn canvas roof as I, a 10-year-old, went in with cash to cover last week's bounce check. Then my mom would come into the store and write another check for that week's groceries, which Balcom's clerks and I both knew would also bounce. We never needed to exchange words. This was our routine. Our family was always taking care of the last disaster, never able to get ahead. We were always pushing our car off the road because it broke down or ran out of gas, and we always had just enough food to survive but never enough to be full. So like so many families at EES, I know what it's like to wrestle with that delicate balance between humiliation with our circumstances and gratitude for the compassion and generosity of others. I started working at a very young age. At 11 years old, I was a cashier at my middle school cafeteria so I could earn a school lunch. And at 12, year old, 12 years old, I joined my mom on weekends at that small business where she typed and I worked in the garage pouring chemical cleaning fluid from a giant bat into small containers. So when families at EES light up when they receive gifts filled with food, blankets, winter coats, and books, I really understand that joy. 
I feel it in a way that I might not have been able to had my childhood circumstances been different. But please don't misunderstand me. I am not glamorizing poverty as though it is a great way for children to learn resilience and compassion. I have to focus on what is positive because my childhood is now history and cannot be changed. So answering the question about why I've dedicated my career to early education is easy. It's the children, it's the families, and it's the teachers. The second question I'm often asked is why there is such high teacher turnover. The heartbreaking fact is that we lose amazing teachers every year because they cannot afford to continue working at such low wages. Just last month, yet another teacher tearfully resigned as she took a job as a cashier at Costco for $17 per hour plus benefits, and we were paying her $13.50 an hour. So every day we are losing quality teachers. We also face eligibility caps that punish parents for working hard and getting ahead. Every month we see families where a parent has gotten a raise and now they're 30 or $40 a month over the eligibility cap. They face the choice of asking their employer to reduce their work hours or not accept the raise, or worse, they get dropped from the program. When this happens, the state sees our enrollment numbers drop and thinks there is less of a need for our services. So if there ever was a, a case study in vicious cycles, this is it. I sit before you today not only as someone who has spent a lifetime advocating for early education, but as the mother of two high school students who also received the gift of preschool and are now actively involved in social action as well as thriving academically. And I was also lucky enough to attend preschool, and as my mother still loves to remind me, I liked it so much I cried when it was time to leave. So thank you for the opportunity to address you today. As I sat down to reflect on my journey, I was able to revisit incredibly hard times and gain new appreciation for what my mother went through. And like many parents, she faced a fork in the road where our fate could go either way. I am thankful for her dedication to hard work, for the kindness of friends who lent me clothing, neighbors who lent a hand, and Balcom's Market who always accepted our checks. Our early education centers are more than a place for children to learn, but a community that helps families break a cycle of poverty. I appreciate your listening to the stories of families like Annabella, whose mother sleeps on the floor, and Oscar, who rides along with his mother as she delivers newspapers, and Tariq, who is in college, and also me, who would not have the honor of addressing you here today if others had not invested in my education and trusted that I would give back to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now open it up for members. Any questions? Mr. McCarty? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple questions for um, Professor Kurt, not just because you're the professor here, but <laughs> by the way, I was extremely uh, moved by our district attorney's um, passion and, and just, you know, striking evidence as far as why it makes sense to, to do those investments. <laughs> but I wonder if, if you can touch on, on two things. One, you talked about this, the, the great research and compared that to there's, you know, the most studied and linked issue, but I wonder if you can talk more about in the recent years what's been coming out as far as um, the neurons and the brain and, and, and brain development and, and maybe touch on that for a few seconds and I may have, then I'll have a second question. Well, the research continues to mount. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is we've known about the importance of early development for 30, 40 years. It became much better known in the 1990s and now. And and the more we learn, the more we understand the long-term effects of deprivations of one kind or another, of stressors of one kind or another, early in life, so that you now can trace patterns of life into the 20s, 30s, 40s, health problems of a whole variety of kinds, lack of uh, antisocial behavior of a whole variety of kinds that come straight out of the fact that those aspects of a child's life that have to do with developing, for example, close attachment ties. Um, aren't there. So it's a, everything we know what we, is basically mounting evidence um, to, to expand the array of problems 
that arise and the, the issues about children's lives that we can change. And I, I think it's important to remember, too, when we start talking about you know, kids being left back and kids not graduating and kids going to special needs, we think about cost savings, it's really important to get in the heads of those kids and families and remember that we're talking about lives and you know, lives that can be changed hugely by families first and foremost, but by us in terms of the kinds of investments we make to support those families and, and those kids. And as I said, all the science is, all the science um, is behind that proposition. Now, what, what about um, some that, that say that it, it's not proven, the science isn't there, they, they bring up, um, you know, the, the Head Start research that says it's, you know, inconclusive. How would you, how would you respond to that? Well, a couple of ways. Um, as several of us, if you, if you just add up the number, the array of studies that people mentioned, and we're happy to provide you with the documentation, there is no, there is no social policy whose benefits have been better demonstrated than early education. And I think there are two studies that the naysayers point to. One of them is the Tennessee study that came out recently, and the other is the old Head Start study. And in a lot of ways, both, in a lot of ways, they make the point that I'm and that we are making. Tennessee, where the effects of early education uh, were no longer evident by the time children were in the third grade, had no program, no curriculum, no coaching, all of those attributes that we know, we heard, right, make for a good early education. They basically said, we're going to expand this program. You pick a curriculum, on you go. Basically, what they chose was a direct education, teacher and child parrot, you know, sort of the parrot instruction, not learning instruction. Um, that's one reason why that program didn't work. Another has to do with that emphasis that I want to underline, which I know my colleagues will share, on the need to, to not think that you can stop you know, reforming education at, at pre-K or earlier and that you've got to carry on. What happens, if, what happens, unless there's some connection between those programs, what it is that these kids have learned is lost. And I know lots, I've talked to lots of and observed lots of kindergarten kids and their parents say, we're bored. We did all that cool stuff in preschool. Now they've got us sitting here in rows and doing, you know, mm. it's kind of like no child left behind, you know, sort of pushed down to, push down to, uh, to kindergarten. So that's one thing I would say. The Head Start study... Um, two things about the Head Start study. One, a long-term study of Head Start kids, comparing them to their siblings who didn't have Head Start, showed you didn't see effects until high school and beyond. And the farther out you got, the more the effects you saw in terms of from high school graduation, jobs, health benefits, et cetera. And, and you know, they call this the sleeper effect, which is a nice way of saying you know, Woody Allen lives or, you know, or we don't know what's going on, but we think is going on, is that children have learned that set of soft skills, all the social, emotional ability to, to engage in self-regulation to, you know, when we were kids, it was works and plays well with others, um, all that stuff, which really carries on having effects throughout the rest of kids' lives. The other thing I'd say about Head Start is Head Start, the Head Start program that was evaluated was the 2004-2005 Head Start program. Head Start today looks very, very different. It's a lot better, and the evaluations that are happening now are showing those benefits. So I, I love talking about the Head Start program and the Tennessee program because I think they make the case uh, if more of a case was needed. Finally, let me just say this. When was the last time you heard somebody say, does kindergarten work? Or you know, does seeing God help a senior year in high school work, right? A comment yesterday was if it wasn't for high school football, there never would be a senior year in high school. Uh, <laughs> take all that money and send it right back down to, to little kids. The question we ask is how do we make school better? How do we make school better? How do we improve quality? And that's the other theme. There are two themes here today. Huge potential, which you can waste by doing nothing and you can waste by doing badly by kids, by not paying the folks who are working in those child care centers, by, you know, where the turnover rate is higher than for any other field except gas station attendance. Because of those, imagine, $13 an hour, imagine that, for, for being responsible for, you know, the ch our children. It's an astonishing sentence to, to, to get across. Um, so that's a, 
Yeah. Not so quick answer to your question. If I could illuminate that in the context of what I do for a living, we do closing arguments as a prosecutor, right? And one of the things we always are addressing is the idea of reasonable doubt, right? And one of the things I've done in most of my trials is I talk about standing in line at the grocery store and looking over and seeing the National Enquirer and there's a story that says Elvis is alive, right? And it has a picture of Elvis and some coveralls with gray hair standing somewhere and there's this thing that <clears throat> Elvis has been alive and dropped out and been working in a car wash in Tupelo for the last uh, 35 years. <clears throat> Is it possible? Of course it's possible. We weren't there when Elvis died, many of us. We weren't uh, watch the toe tag. We didn't, you know, uh, attend an autopsy or any of that sort of stuff. But is it reasonable? Is it reasonable with what all you know, all the facts, all the empirical data, is it reasonable? And I would submit with these studies in, in the aggregate with what we know, the demonstrable scientific method and the stories that those, those studies that are, uh, that are inconsistent in some way are, are just uh, not really relevant to the overall analysis. It's... it's it's demonstrably proven that uh, early childhood education has all the benefits that we've described, and it's not reasonable to conclude otherwise. Okay. We have one more question, Dr. Weber. Um, and I think maybe it's you again, Dr. Kerr, or anybody else, but um, you, know, you, you talked about uh, <clears throat> programs and the importance of having mixed income individuals in there besides you know, other diversity, which is probably important as well. And so, of course, when you look at Head Start, those aren't because those are, you have to, there's, they're income-based. Our, our state preschool, predominantly, it's based on income. I guess some programs you can, other people can pay into. Um, and, and I wanted to, cause I wanted to, to focus on this for a second because you know we're having this debate right now. We're going to have a big, as Dr. Weber said, in a couple weeks, a discussion on the budget proposal. That's not what we're talking about here today. But kind of a, a bigger picture is that, uh, you know, one of the ideas in California is we can't afford – to do it all. You know, we can't afford to do preschool for all. That's $3 billion. That's, you know, we didn't pass the measure 10 years ago on the ballot. A couple years ago, we just couldn't afford it. So the focus is on, on um, doing it, you know, with the kids who need it the most, the lowest income kids first. And, and, and you're alluding to that that has some challenges because, you know, the learning structure. And so what, what advice would you give to us as we're trying to grapple with this because we don't have, uh, unfortunately, the New York model right now with a big suitcase full of cash to do it. And right now we're debating like our, our, our traditional kindergarten program, right? It, it, it's doing well, research showing that it, it, the, the success um, numbers are, are, you know, are, are there. And um, there's a proposal out there to, to get rid of it and potentially have it means tested. And so, you know, that's an issue that you raised there. So I wonder if you could enlighten us here. We're in a transitional time. This is a conversation that will sound really uh, 10 years from now. It would sound the same way as the conversation would have sounded. Uh, should kindergarten be available to all kids? What about, high, you know, what about high school? Isn't elementary education enough? So if you don't like my idea of taking senior year and getting rid of senior year, which, by the way, I tried this out as a kind of facetious notion, and a number of your colleagues started looking into it more seriously than I thought they would. Just, um, think about the fact that the only difference between pre-K and K, or first grade, is the potential of children to learn. That if you really do early education right, the, the, the youngest years are really the crucial foundational years. Um, and so again, if you look at how much money we're spending on early education, New York spends $10,000 a child. Well, the, the national app for preschool, it spends $17,000, $18,000 a child for K-12. The national average for K-12 is about $13,000 a year. There's always money. It's a huge budget that exists. There's always money to be had. You can, you can have a conversation between the criminal justice system, which is what we really were beginning to have, and the K-12 system, which doesn't go on in this, in this context. But I think as a matter of principle, this is part of the common school system. You know, the place where, where the, the, the middle class, the poor kids, the kids from a whole variety of backgrounds need to come together. Uh, it's a place, early education, universal education, responds to the needs 
of kids, not just the poorest kids. Um, I would argue that one of the reasons that uh, early education is has been woefully funded in California has been that it's been seen as a poor people's program. And there's a mantra from Ed Ziegler, who's one of the founders of Head Start, programs for poor people are poor programs. Because, you know, compare Medicare and Medicaid and the way in which they've been treated in terms of who winds up, who winds up benefiting. You go back to Head Start. Ed Ziegler, again, the architect of Head Start, said, you know, this ought to be a program open to all kids. And let middle class parents and upper class parents pay on a sliding scale to get into the program. It was, that's as a way station to get from here to, to free pre-K to all or free education to all is a strategy that, that deserves to be thought of. Many, 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 many parents who are paying now an average of $9,000 a year statewide, and we know how high those numbers can actually get statewide, it costs more to go to preschool than it does to go to Cal State. Um, many of those parents would just leap at the opportunity to get a high-quality, publicly funded early education. Thank you. I really enjoyed this discussion. Some of us have, have, have been having this around our communities and throughout the state for some time. I'm 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 looking for um, an answer to something I hear often. Not something I really prescribe to as the argument, but I think it, it needs to be said. Is that? Uh, in the Republican Party, the more conservative element, I guess, up here. In fact, I think I'm the only Republican that attended this meeting here of all eight of us. The There's this discussion that of uh, government is taking the role of raising our children, that there's no longer a – you start to cringe your neck. That's interesting. There's a no longer a uh, – a, um, we're trying to have government take the role of the family, and where's the role of the family as far as parenting? Are we are we taking over the uh, the the role of the parent? I I'm sure other folks in the panel will have more to say than I, but let me just start by saying the average mother, whatever her socioeconomic background, is back at work within six months of the time that her child is born. You know, back in the day, you know, when the dad could go off and have a nice job and make a decent wage and send the kids to good public schools and they could take a vacation in the camper and mom could tell you, stay home and raise the kids, that's the world that you're describing. That isn't, as you know, as we know, that's not the world of today. So families, it's not as though families aren't the primary caretakers of their kids and have primary responsibilities. As a matter of economic fact, it's not possible for parents to discharge those responsibilities by being home and still being able to put bread on the, on the table for their kids. And besides, one of the things we've learned in those 40 years, and we've been talking about it, is that early education matters. A lot happens in the home, and a lot can happen to a child in an environment that's outside the home as she or he begins to explore the world. Any comments on that? So I would have two comments. Um, the first is that high quality early childhood education programs engage parents. That's a hallmark of the kinds of programs that we're talking about because we know that it isn't just, it isn't enough for children to experience um, the kinds of interactions that help to scaffold brain development in their early literacy and their early math. And so it's incredibly important that there's a partnership um, with the parents and that high quality early childhood programs they support parents in becoming um, more involved in their children's education um, more um, uh, more knowledgeable about their child's development and the other piece I'll say which is just a, on a personal note um, I have three kids um, almost 26 year old twins and a 22 year old and I went back to work uh, when my twins were six weeks old um, out of economic necessity and also with my career. And I think that if they were here testifying, um, they would tell you that nobody else raised them but their parents. Um, that there were lots of partners and there were lots of people along the way that, I mean, it, it does take a village and, and several villages. But um, the idea that um, because my child is in um, 
a high quality early care program that they're parenting that child and not me it just doesn't even add up with with my own personal experience or the experience of others that I've known. Okay. By the way, I agree with you. I, I had to ask the question because I'm, I want to put it on the record. <laughs> Pardon? Is it because you're always being asked that by your colleagues? Because so, yeah. I've been for the doctor can relax now. I'm one of the good guys. I actually support No, them. I know. I, 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 I figure we're giving you ammunition. That's, yeah. that's our job. Yeah, okay. And the, the other point I want to bring up is, and it goes to the issue you're talking, you used the word quality about four times in your discussion. Um, there's a lot of discussion about, well, what is quality uh, zero through five? And, and when I talk to superintendents and school board members on this issue, they're fearful of a, of a drain of their resources because they're looking at, you know, K through 12, and when you start giving them zero through five, they think, well, wait a minute, are you going to give me, more? where's this money coming from, where's my responsibility at? Uh, so my question is, how would you define quality uh, and what it would be the partnership or environment through the zero through five? Is it a public-private partnership? It is, is it a... Uh, you know, we have a lot of good programs out there. We talked earlier about Montessori. When I was in the military, we had uh, NIAC accredited programs on the basis for our children. You know, how would you, how would you define quality that we could add to the discussion with our school board members and our other colleagues that this is not K through 12. This is something different, and this is how it would look like as we define quality. Who could answer that? I'd like to jump in on that one. Um, I'd like to go back first um, to your setup of the question um, because I really think it's a false choice. Um, we, we hear this a lot um, about, well, if you fund birth through five well, then that means there isn't enough resources and other resources going to be shifting. And, and I would go back to what um, Dr. Kirp said, and it's not a zero-sum game here. There are – it's a big budget – and our budget, um, how we spend our money, whether it's our household or in our governance, um, reflects priorities. I never heard anybody say, should we fund the Marines or the Navy? I've never heard that. So, Well, they do in, D in the Pentagon all the time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I I've been involved in those discussions. <laughs> Last I checked, they were both still funded, though. So, um, Not really, but okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I won't argue okay. the point. <laughs> but going also back to your point about um, the NAEYC accredited centers um, on military basis. So NAEYC has had a, um, a program and a system of recognizing um, and um, um, acknowledging, accrediting um, high quality within early childhood centers. We've seen a shift where now states have quality rating and improvement systems, and they're maturing to the point where there's actually evaluations and there's data that's coming out. And there are some real um, key pieces of quality that we see across all of the, the studies or what anybody actually talks about quality. And it goes back to what we talked about earlier, and that is the quality of the interactions the quality of the interactions between the adults and the children that are in their care and that they're educating. And, and that back and forth um, scaffolding, um, that engagement, it, isn't so, it doesn't happen by magic. It actually is really important and it takes a high, um, highly qualified person who has um, had not only um, in their college education with a high quality um, teacher preparation program, but also good feedback and practical experiences within classrooms. So we know that, and, and as I was sitting here, I was thinking, you know, I, I might have, maybe I should have focused my remarks around professional development, because that is absolutely key to the kind of system that we are trying to develop here. We've, we've learned that through what happened with Head Start. The bar was set high in Head Start, and everybody said, oh, no, that can't happen, and all the deadlines were met ahead of time, and now we're seeing those changes within Head Start. So we know that the, the qualifications, the dispositions, the skill of the person who's in that early care setting is absolutely key to the hallmarks of quality that make a difference. 